Father, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunities to teach your word, to minister on behalf of you. And Lord, we just praise you and thank you, Lord, that you give us the right words to say, the right examples. Everything about it, Lord, is you. And we thank you, Father, for results, Lord. In the book of Acts, Peter spoke and people all over just cut to the heart. Change was occurring. Father, I just pray that same thing happened tonight, that change impact people's lives, Father. We just praise you and thank you, Lord, that you are the deliverer of all, of all people. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to be talking tonight about praying with authority. And I'm going to start out in Matthew 28 and in verse 18. And it says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even into the end of the age. Amen. It, it, this is a, such a powerful scripture here. And really, it is the proclamation to the church. What is the purpose of the church? Well, it's right here. The purpose of the church is to reach the lost, to disciple them, to grow them up, to, to care for them, to minister them, to baptize them, to just continually grow and, and thrive as a being, see that, that this is this. What is our purpose? Well, that's our purpose. And so the Holy Spirit, He's promising us through the Holy Spirit that He will never leave us nor forsake us. Glory to God. See, and that includes prayer. That we have to pray about these things. That we have to pray and see impact. It's really pray and act is what it is. And so when you pray and act based upon what He's telling you to do. There are such forces in heaven that you will not be able to stop the church. And so we, one of the things that you know, we have to challenge ourselves is really to take this on to ourselves personally, individually, as well as the church. And see, because this is really for the church globally as well. But we can't do anything about the church globally other than pray for them. But I mean, us as individuals say, Lord, how do I plug into the mission of the church? How do I begin to reach people? How do I begin to converse with people? How do I begin to even just start talking with people? You know, with social media today, there's a lot of opportunities to do that, more than there was before. So we, so we always have to think even beyond our own borders in, in terms of where we are and how we're interacting with people. So it, it is one of those things that we know that when we pray, that he's given us authority to carry out these things. One of the, the definitions of grace that I always like is he empowers you. He's empowered you to do these things. And so when, when does that happen? Well, it ends up happening when we start doing them. Amen? <laughs> it just doesn't work until we start doing them. You know, you never, until you put yourself at risk, you know, about whether this is real, real or not, that's when you feel, that's when you know God shows up and things begin to change. So we have to get out of our comfort zone and really get out there and just really begin to pray and act about the way, the way the Lord is directing us to go. Now, praying his word over people impacts people. I mean, you know, Matthew 6.10 says, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, I was raised Catholic. I know the Lord's Prayer front, back, inside, and out. I could recite it, man. I could do it in about five seconds. And so... You know, that's how we used to do it. We used to, you know, get it done and things like that because the more we, faster we did it, the faster we got out. So, you know, so we had incentive. So I could, I, you know, I can do that. But, you know, I, Pastor Mark was teaching on the Lord's Prayer one day and I actually read it for the first time. Amazing. <laughs> and, and so, and now every time I read it, I go, wow, this is actually pretty good, you know. After all these years, you know, you just start looking, well, this is really a very powerful prayer. And one of the things he's saying here is, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How do we pray? We pray, how is heaven? How is heaven? What is heaven like? See, you've got to think about this. What are the rules in heaven? Is everybody saved in heaven? 
think so. Yeah, I don't think so. anybody there is not saved. Yeah. So the will of the Lord is for everybody to be saved. Is there, are there any sick people in heaven? Any people with crutches, you know, any, anything like that, anything going on like that? No, they're not. Then the will of the Lord is that everybody be healed. See, we need to really settle this in our heart about the various things that we see in life that it's not a fact that, well, they, they had a hard luck and all this kind of thing. No, the will of the Lord is on earth as it is in heaven. And so we need to really let that grow in ourselves as we pray and say, Father, show me how to pray this way. Show me how the bounds of this go to where I can really impact people with this prayer. Because when you begin to direct people in that, in that way and begin to pray over them, there's great power there in that. And so just begin to ask yourself, you know, well, how is heaven? And how do I, how do I pray about that to, to impact the people here? So it's, it's all about that and how God does things. There's other scriptures here, and there's about 12 scriptures here that will keep you very busy praying. It's okay to pick up the Bible and pray from it. It's an open book test. Okay? And so and it's good to, to write it. Sometimes I write in mine, and I personalize it. I'll, I'll change it to where it says you, I'll say I, you know, or something like that. You know, so you know, when I'm praying for Pastor Mark, I pray for him out of Colossians chapter 3, that he's filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that he walks perfectly before the Lord in everything that he does. And so, you know, you just begin to pray that over people. And, and you know, that's why you don't say, well, Lord, just help them. Well, no, that's, that's like what? You know, so you, you say you begin to pray scriptures over them that will help them. Yeah. Does it impact them? Yeah. Well, yeah. I can tell when it, when it happens, you know, when it, that he's particularly good one day, but when I don't pray for him, he's not, you know. So it's just like I can see sometimes, you know. He struggles, you know. So it's just, it, it impacts people when you pray for them. And so when you're praying the word, heaven's not going to go, well, you can't do that. No, they're going to say, amen, let that, be, let that happen right now. See, that's how you can impact nations. That's how you can impact cities. That's how you can impact governments. As you just begin to pray the word over them. And don't sit there and, and, and start commenting about how stupid they are while you're praying for them. That just nullifies everything that you just did, okay? And stay off of Facebook and all these other things, posting things about how dumb people are, Yeah. But just begin to pray over them. You will, you will see change. Well, what if they're not saved? They'll get saved. You keep praying that over them, they'll get saved. Amen? And we'll cover that in a future time about praying for people to be saved, things to do over, over that. There's one goal, golden rule of prayer I always have to remind myself. God will not answer a prayer on something he told us to do. If he told us to do something, he's not going to do it for us. Now, it's okay to ask him how. It's okay to ask him for wisdom on how to approach this and timing of it. It's okay to ask those kind of questions on there. But if he has given you something to do, you don't have to say, well, Lord, you know, I wish he would just do it for me. No, he, he has empowered you to do that. And so part of prayer is really seeking that and understanding how to best get it done. Every person, major person in Scripture, you will see them. The Lord has empowered them to do something, and they've gone before the Lord and asked, how? How do you want me to do this? Or if you want me to do this particular step first. See, it's real critical that you're, you, you're asking him now, what is it, that, how do I do this the best? How do I make the most impact of this for the kingdom of God? See, that's a kingdom-minded thought and prayer that begins to line up, and he will show you things that you need to do. He will even come up with stuff that we haven't even thought about. Amen? Because he's, he's all in on this mission of doing things on there. So if you're asking God about something 
that he's already told you to do, you know, don't ask him to do it. Don't expect him to do it. Just happen or somebody else to do it. He's empowered you to do it. Amen? And so you're a player and you're critical in that, in that happening. Now, I'm going to start talking about a subject that, that as we get into it, there's a recent barn. I like Barna research because they go out and actually talk to people that go to church and they, and they do surveys of where the church is on, on their thought of things, you know. And yeah, it can be disgusting when you're looking at different parts of it and saying, how in the world can, can people believe those kind of things? But, but, but it gives you a really good view of the church. And, and so we're going to start, we're going to talk some tonight about the demonic realm. And, and um, the, this was in 2020. So very recent survey that they did that said 44% of the church doesn't believe that the demonic realm exists. And so, you know, I'm not going to show, have a show of hands or anything like that because I don't want to know. But you, when I see these kind of things, I just figure there's probably about 44% of the people here or online that, that have no idea. They probably buy in with that and say, well, there's no such thing as the demonic realm. You know, so we're going to deal with that tonight. And we're going to, you know, for those of you who already believe, we're just going to learn something additional to this. But it's, but it's critical that, that we really kind of come to agreement on some of these things. Now, Luke 10, 17 says that when 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. <clears throat> Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names were written in heaven. So they had gone out and they had cast out demons, and they came back rejoicing about that, that they had power even over the demonic realm. And so that's what that, that scripture is about. And, and, and even in the Great Commission, when you go over into Mark chapter 16's version of it, there's, we cast out devils. And so that is that version of, the, of what he said at that point in time. It just kind of exemplifies and amplifies on what, it, what was said. So if you have somebody that doesn't believe that the demonic realm exists, you know, if they're, if they, they can only kind of go two different directions. If they're thinking that everything's just random, I can't deal with that, honestly, because random people just kind of go every which direction, and you never can pin them down, so you just waste a lot of time on that. But the other th prevalent thought you see out there is God is sovereign, and because God is sovereign, everything that happens is basically orchestrated and ordained by God, and so that's really a very prevalent belief. Sounds great. Uh, the only problem is, is he's delegated a lot of things to the church. And, and so, as far as I know, he hasn't taken those delegations back. Amen? So, let's, let's get into that a little bit here and, 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 and deal with that. Because, you, you know, if you, if you, you probably know people that, that really think this way, and that's okay. So, let's just take some modern current events that are going on. And see, what about COVID-19? Was that, um, did God orchestrate that? Would God orchestrate closing down the churches because of COVID-19? That's just these things you get into. If you say, well, yeah, God just uh, <laughs> wanted to punish people and all these kinds of things. But well, what about the churches? That's his bride. Amen. Amen. So, so, you know, the, it's always thinking, looking at that and saying, okay, what about the recent riots? All the violence and things that have been going on, the destruction that's been going on, all, all those events going on, is that, is that a God thing? You know, because if you think that God is sovereign and he's made these decisions and he's just unleashed all this stuff, you know, well, it's, uh, okay. So what about China? China has recently, well, they've been basically 
bulldozing churches and uh, banning, they just recently banned the cross and some other things that they're doing against the church to shut it down there. Is that a God thing? Did God orchestrate that? See, when you go down this uh, God is sovereign trail, you get in where things just start breaking down. Because what happens when you start really kind of breaking it down into specific examples here is that would mean that God was really warring against his own self. And, and Jesus talked about that in the case of Satan, but, but we're going to pick this up in Mark 3, verse 24. He said, if a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but has an end. See, they had accused him of casting out devils by the spirit of, the, of Satan. And so he was responding to that. But the key here is he said that a kingdom, if it's a kingdom divided against itself, it can't stand. See, we hear people quote this a lot, but they don't even know God. But they know this part of it. They don't even know it's scripture, probably. But God is not going to war against himself. And so, you know, you always got to kind of go down that trail with people to really just say, well, why does it matter? Well, because they're sitting there thinking that, well, hey, why, what can I possibly do? Hey, God is doing all this, so I just hunker down. You know, well, that doesn't help. That means 44% of the church is not helping. That's not healthy. And so, and so we need everybody engaged in this. And so it's okay to engage in these kind of discussions and just go example by example and just point at something, especially when it happens to the church. It's, uh, you know, and so it's just, it, it really breaks down and, and then all of a sudden makes no sense that, that he would war against himself. So anyway, that, that's um, a house divided itself. It, it cannot stand. Now, we ought to get into how God describes himself. And really, you know, when you run into people that think God is sovereign, they really get into this view that, hey, he's got good days and he's got bad days. And that's not really true at all. He's always good. Amen. But First John 5 says, this is the message that we've heard from him and declared to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Now, there's Amplified Bible is, is one of these Bibles. I'll only look at it from a research standpoint. I tried reading it as a daily Bible and it wears me out because it, just, it basically goes back to the original Greek language and, and there's a lot of translation that happens in there and usually... It's multiple words being used to describe one word, which is probably more accurate than, than anything else. But, but by the time you get through some of these verses, it, it, wear, you know, it, yeah, it can get tiring. But this one's actually pretty good. He says, that God is light. He is holy. His message is truthful. He is perfect in righteousness. So that's what light is meaning there in, in that. And in him is no darkness at all. There's no sin there's no wickedness. There's no imperfection. He's perfect in all his ways. Amen. I mean, no wickedness. Unable to do wickedness. See, I, that's, that's how God is. Yeah, that's not him. And so when you look at current events and things that are happening on a daily basis, you know, and then look at the character of God, is a case of not knowing who he really is and not really knowing him as a person and just coming to grips with the fact that, yeah, there's not any darkness in him. He is, he is incapable of being doing something wicked. And so we have to line that up and, and look at it from that, that standpoint to know that he's for us and he's not against us, amen? That, that he's, he's constantly on for us and so as we engage in him and, and engage his kingdom, then things begin to fall in place for us. 
Now, looking at the demonic realm, there's several terms that are being used in the Bible that talks about it. But when I looked at a lot of, there's 27 books in the New Testament. And so there's 22 of those 27. So there's about over 80% of the New Testament books have something about the demonic realm in them. So it's a very prevalent theme. And we'll see in a little bit, it's a very prevalent theme. And so it used several terms to describe that realm. And, and so on that, there, there basically is demons being the first number one category that you see in the Bible, followed by Satan, followed by the devil, followed by serpents, followed by principalities, and then again, Antichrist. And so those all come up to about 169 references that start in Matthew and go all the way through the book of Revelation. And so... It's not just an idle subject. It's not just a minor subject. It's hard to find a book. So you can only find five books that doesn't have a mention about it. And so, you, you know, you got to step back and look at it and go, well, this is a theme that's in here that, yeah, they're real. And so if they're real in the book of Revelation, which hasn't all happened yet, you know, but then they're still here today. They haven't taken a vacation. They haven't just kind of gone into hiding. They're very, very present. In fact, they're very, very active in the events that I just talked about. And so they're very, very active on a day-to-day -day basis. And so, so we as a church, really to be very effective in our prayers, have to really come against these things and, and really take, take them to heart. When you look at the major themes of the Bible, that uh, God is, is, of course, the first topic, that's on, and that's the way it should be. Jesus is second. And faith is third, love is, two, is, sec, is fourth, and the demonic realm really is in the fifth. So it's in the top five subjects that the New Testament covers. See, the Satan really is, is talked about in a lot of different ways. He's a liar and a father of lies. He's stealing. Anybody see any stealing going on? <laughs> a lot of lying going on, anybody? Uh, a lot of killing going on. A lot of destruction going on, a lot of deception going on. See, I mean, you know, when you look at these things and you look at these events, if you had somebody just walk into a shopping mall and just and shoot a bunch of people, well, there's there's who who is doing that? Well, the person's got responsibility, but there's a demonic involvement there. Amen. And so we need to really, as a church, come to grips with this and say, okay, you know, they are not supposed to be able to do that. Right. Amen? That we have authority over them. Right. Why? Because Jesus said, we tread upon scorpions and serpents and all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means harm us. Amen? Amen. And so we need to really kind of take that scripture to, to task and really begin to apply that and in our prayers, begin to not only, as we get into this, bind things, loose things, begin to really impact those kind of activities that's going on. What opens the door for, for the demonic realm? Well, fear. It's amazing. COVID-19, uh, all the newscasts, all the, the headlines, all the, all the everything, and it's still going on. Constant barrage, constant barrage, you know, and now constant, it's going to get worse, going to get worse, you know. And so and people are not that smart that they can do all this. And so there's some demonic influence going on there to what to keep, continue to put fear in the air. I mean, I walked into Costco one day and, I, and they looked at me and they said, well, you must be wanting the toilet paper line. And I go, I don't, <laughs> I don't want you to need toilet paper. Yeah, I didn't even know there was a special line. So it's just, you know, it's, and, but you could feel the fear in the store. Amen. And so people were scared. People are still scared. And so when you have fear in there, you cannot be in faith and fear at the same time. Amen. And Scripture tells us that anything that's not of faith is sin. And so we have to really deal with that. And, you know, if it begins, if this is a constant thing that's going on, there's a spirit involved here. 
that has to be dealt with and, and gotten out of that. And so until you deal with that, that will just constantly inhabit your place at that time. Envy is another one because it insults God as our provider. Anger, having to walk in love. Lying, pride, sexual immorality, all these kinds of things. It's not just the actions, it's the thoughts unto themselves. If we're constantly thinking about these things, then, then we're really causing a barrier between us and God. And, and, and so we really need to, like the Lord told me one day, he says, you know, he, eh, he stopped me. He said, you're really getting casual about sinning and it doesn't seem to bother you anymore. You know, and I thought, well, I didn't want to hear that. <laughs> you know, I'm like, whoa. So it's okay. He, he didn't mean to harm. He's just saying, you know, you need to shore it up. We need, to really, we need to get very sensitive about the things that we do and see and hear and, and really begin to, you know, repentance is a way of life in a way. It, it's something that we should always be looking at and, and doing and saying, have I done something here, Lord, to cause a barrier between us? It's part of just being our consciousness of him. And so we get so casual and cavalier with things you know, that, that we hear and do and see, kind of like the trash can example, that it just keeps filling up and filling up and overflowing. So, so repentance is one of those things that we ought to come to grips with. And, and really, I've tried to get myself into the habit of even when I can't think of anything wrong, I know there's stuff. And I just say, Lord, help me here. Help me remind me of something I need to do here. Yeah, because if you don't, it'll just build up and build up and it'll create a separation and it'll cause your prayers not to be answered. Amen? Because you're separated at that point. So you just need to be very, very aware of that. So our battle is not against people. Ephesians 6.10 says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. So our battle is not against people. It's not against flesh and blood. See, with people we see, we see them take action, we get angry. Somebody flips me off on the freeway, you know, I go, man, I can't believe they did that, you know. And, and so, you know, all these kinds of things that happen to us, but we don't really, we let the spirit that's behind that get away with it. And so it just continues. So it's just, you know, it's, so we need to be, say, Lord, help me to see the spirit behind these things. When I start to see campaigns of fear, I immediately start looking and going, okay, where is this coming from? When I start to see, you know, all kinds of mayhem and violence and people being killed and things like that, it's like, okay, he, you know, where is that coming from? So, it's, you know, it, it's not, we have to not get, stare at the people. Now they have responsibility and the law will deal with all that. But I mean, it's just, we have to really begin to become very spiritually minded and really understand but there's a spiritual battle going on. And if we don't do something to stop it in the spirit, then basically they'll just continue on and on and on. So that's the church's job is to stop that and, and really begin to, to, to call a halt to that. Now it describes the fact that there's principality, there's powers, there's rulers, there's different levels of spirits. We won't get into that tonight, but they, there, there's assignments in each level that, that goes there. And so, you know, if you wonder why people go to Washington and don't ever do anything, even though they promised, I guarantee it's one of those definitions right there. And so, you know, or do just the opposite of what they said they were going to do. It, it's in one of those definitions right there. So we have to understand that, that in order for people to be able to think clearly, for, for people to be able to make wise decisions, wise godly decisions, that they need to be spiritually free. They need to be free to be able to think clearly on things like that. It's amazing the pressure that's there. And so we, we just need to become very aware of it in our prayer life 
and begin to deal with those spirits. We bind the devil off of people, places, and events. Mark 3, 27, Jesus said, No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man, and then he plunders his house. So, so he's talking here about binding the devil. Bind is a word that, that, that basically means he tie, we tie him up, we forbid him from acting, we relegate his activity null and void, that we declare him unlawful. And so we bind, just like D, Jesus bound that, those spirits, we say, Satan, we bind you in Jesus' name to cease that activity right now in Jesus' name and cease that plan and you, that you're hatching here. And so we just begin to talk to the spirits and we command them to, to cease their activity in Jesus' name. That name of Jesus is so powerful, they'll, they'll just bow the knee and stop. Amen? Amen? And so you just continue when you see things and say, well, we'll bind that spirit. And what I typically do then again is I loose the Holy Spirit into those situations to really begin to bring peace, to begin to bring reconciliation, to begin to really cause healing to happen in those things. I mean, let him have at it. And if their labors need to be sent in, you pray that as well. And so, well, what does that do? Well, it stops the harassing spirits from, from causing trouble, and, and it allows, and it gives the Holy Spirit permission to enter into that scene. And that's powerful. He, he can do far more in, in, in amount of time than, than anybody could ever do on there. One more scripture here is... In Matthew 18, and I'm again, I'm going to go the Amplified here on this one, 18, 18, he says, Truly I tell you, whatever you forbid and declare to be improper and unlawful on earth must be what is already forbidden in heaven. And whatever you permit and declare proper and lawful on earth must be what is already permitted in heaven. So he's talking about the, the, the prayer lining up with with. Matthew 6.10, he's talking about your kingdom come, your will be done. And so if it's lawful in heaven, we declare that present here on the earth. If it's illegal in heaven, then we declare that stop right now in, 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 right now in Jesus' name. And so we begin to line up our thoughts with how heaven is, and we begin to line up our acts with that. And then that's how we begin to pray for that, and we just begin to see change, amen? And so as you plug into this area, you know, you begin to see, seek the Lord. What is going on that I don't see? What, you know, what kind of plans are being hatched that we don't see? What kind of things that are going on that, that we need to pray about? And this is, for praying in the Spirit, this is an area of, that, that can help because sometimes you're just not sure you know, all the plots that are going on. And you're probably better off not knowing some of the plots that are going on. But sometimes that you, if you ask the Lord, hey, can I help pray about something? Boy, you have just plugged into him right there. And he will begin to expand you and, and begin to show you things that you didn't even know existed. And see, that's really, that's really then working in tandem with him and now you're, you're beginning to see changes happening in areas that you didn't even know there were issues at. Amen? So this is the position of authority of a believer, that when you're praying about these things, you're not just saying words just casually, like I would go through historically with the Lord's Prayer, but you're, you're beginning to take them and advance them and see change. And that's why then you, then you see lives change. Then you see cities change. Then you see governments change. And so, you know, for the kingdom of God. Father, we bless you and we thank you, Lord, for the authority of the church, Lord, that you've given us such power and authority to, to do good for you, Lord. Father, help us, Father. We, especially if we're not sure, Lord, what, of what to do. We thank you for your wisdom. We thank you. Father, for, for more revelation on this as, as, we, as we speak. And we just praise you and give you glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen.